Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so um, I am Jennifer Borland. I am the director of the Center for the Humanities, and I'm excited to have you all here today um, to learn a little bit more about um, Chat GPT. And this session is led by um, three of our uh, current Humanities Research Group Fellows, Rosemary Evans, Richard Sylvester, and Heather Stewart, who are all um, members of our group that is focused on digital humanities. And um, so with that program, um, we have a lot of opportunities to kind of institute new ways of doing research. And I wanted to mention that we have um, some information currently on our website, and I'll uh, post the links when I'm done talking here, um, not only about the fellowship program itself, um, but we're also uh, still welcoming um, applications for next year's program. And those uh, are um, due on Monday, the 27th. Um, and also we have an event on um, April 20, sorry, April 14, um, that I'll also post information about um, that is an opportunity to hear about um, the research of all three of our research groups um, for this year. So this is one of our groups, but we have two others as well. So I just want to encourage people if they're interested in the program or hearing more about the research of these three excellent fellows, um, that you can hear more about that um, at that event. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers, and I'll post a few links in the chat. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really excited to share what we've been thinking about and get some conversations started on campus about artificial intelligence and what we're going to do with it here in um, our careers and the industries that we're preparing students for. Um, and as researchers. Uh, so we're looking at um, this technology from the perspective of um, its impact in these in these different areas. And today um, we want to talk specifically about some of the ethical concerns regarding it, um, some of the theoretical ideas around it, and then um, some practical discussion too. And we will save Q&A for the end, but if at any time you want us to stop and clarify something or talk more about any particular points, that's totally fine. And I'd rather do more of a conversation in this setting. Um, just to start off, I'm wondering, um, since we have such a small group, if you could um, raise your emoji hand or your actual hand if you have um, used chat GPT before? No one? One. Okay. All right. Well, good. Okay. Well, awesome. So we'll we'll walk you through how it works and what it is. Okay. There's two. Good. Um, and then we, but we'll also kind of be discussing it from another another level. So first, we have to kind of introduce you to it so we can talk about it um, from the same perspective. So um, let me know if at any time there's trouble with my screen sharing because I feel like my students never tell me till it's too late. So I'm sure you will let me know <laughs> if I'm not sharing what I think I'm sharing. So I, you can see my screen now. Yes. And presentation. Okay, great. Here we are. Um, this is a little joke about us. So um, Heather is a professor in philosophy and studies ethics, and I'm um, a media scholar, and I study um, community and identity and communication strategies. Um, Richard is a doctoral student in English and rhetoric. So when you put the three of us together and we start thinking about things happening on the internet, um, we we really found that the ethics and concerns around the use of these things for um, for purposes of um, research productivity um, and for the purposes of, that we all share in common um, in College of Arts and Sciences of teaching students to be critical thinkers and good readers and writers, um, those areas were the ones that really came together for us to, um, to look at it during the time of our fellowship and beyond. Um, so today we're going to talk through these five things, um, assuming we get to them all. The first is to just show you what this is and how it works. So you can, you've probably heard of it. You've heard people talking about it. I think when people say artificial intelligence, it makes it sound like some, you know, computer programming thing that's really difficult or weird um, and maybe out of our, out of our wheelhouse in, in the College of Arts and Sciences. At least for me, that's what my first thought was. Um, so once you see it, you'll be like, oh, that's, you know, I know what that is. I've seen that in other places. Um, and I want to put it in historical perspective briefly um, and just talk about um, the development of new technologies and why we as scholars tend to um, look at these through these different critical lenses. 
Um, then we're going to talk about ethical concerns. We'll talk about um, rhetorical agency and flattening and the idea of alterity and perspectives on um, how this interacts with ChatGPT. And then we're going to talk about some potentials for using artificial intelligence textual generators like this um, in equity efforts and to kind of um, help in some of the areas where there is um, concern about equity and um, across different populations in different contexts in the university. So um, first let's talk let's let's introduce it. Um, Heather, you want to talk us through um, the oh, there we go what it is and what it can do. Sure. Thanks, Rosemary. Okay, so ChatGPT, which is our focus for today, is one type of what's called generative AI. So generative AI is a category, a sort of specific kind of AI algorithms that what they do is they draw on large data sets, so large training uh, data sets, to generate what appear to be sort of novel outputs. So it's not an algorithm that's simply uh, ordering existing things, but rather it uh, is generating something new or novel. So um, there are uh, generative AI systems which can generate new visual images. So maybe I put in some textual prompt to say, um, create an image of an ethicist, a writer and a strategist talking in front of or on a Zoom or something. And, and maybe I get some image in response to that. Uh, there's also generative AI that can produce uh, videos, animated videos, other kinds of videos, and also uh, chat GPT um, and, and similar kinds of textual generative AI are going to generate new bits of text. Sorry, I don't have the clicking. I'm the clicker. I'm the clicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so chat GPT in particular uh, is one of these text generation chatbots. It's developed by OpenAI. And it was introduced in November of 2022, so very recently. And the newest iteration of it, which is ChatGPT4, just came out this month. So what this is, is it's a large language model that's trained on a ton of data um, that's sort of uh, scraped from the internet, from what's publicly available on the internet. And what it does is it's trained to predict the next word in a sequence, so to complete a pattern, right? So if I say twinkle, twinkle, it might say little star. That's a very sort of simple, simplified uh, example, but you kind of get what I mean. And it's improved by reinforcement learning. Uh, this happens in a number of ways, but in terms of us as users, we offer human feedback to it. So when we're interacting with it, uh, we can do things like thumbs up if it gives us an answer that's satisfying to us, thumbs down if it gives us something we think is inaccurate or maybe um, not the kind of answer that we were looking for, and that feeds back into its training. Okay, so what capabilities does ChatGPT have? Uh, so you'll see in some of the screenshots that we have, but it sounds very human. So it can mimic human conversation or sort of chat with you about any number of things that you might want to chat about. Um, so you might want to talk about uh, some movie and what the themes or ideas are in that movie or really anything you can think of. It can compose written materials. So you can uh, put in an essay prompt and it can generate an essay for you. Uh, it can write articles about things. It can You can give it an idea for a screenplay and put some particular characters in and maybe what the rough idea for the plot is, and it can give you a screenplay or a script. Uh, you can give it an idea for a song, and it can generate a song for you, poems, uh, any kind of uh, written, written material that you might want. And you can request that that material comes in sort of different tones, like uh, produce this essay in an angry tone. Uh, or in different styles. So you might say produce this uh, explanation of something in the style of Dr. Seuss or in the style of a Taylor Swift song uh, and for different types of audiences. So you might say explain this to a six-year-old or maybe to a college freshman or maybe to somebody with a PhD. It can also take tests. It can uh, write computer code, translate computer code, uh, fix broken computer code, all kinds of things that it can do. Uh, so a couple things about how it works. So there is the free version that we can all um, access by signing up for it. There's also the paid subscription uh, versions. The newest iteration is currently in that paid model. Um, notably, sign up requires uh, acceptance of terms and conditions, which do stipulate that you are giving your data up uh, to continue to um, train the model. And again, the way that it works is the user inputs a textual prompt and it receives an output um, using those language prediction algorithms. Um, and again, those inputs and the, the sort of feedback from the user go back in to continue to refine the model. 
Okay, so uh, when you access it, you verify that you, um, you unlike it, um, are a human being. And these are just some examples that when, when you hit the landing page, things that it tells you it can do, right? So explain quantum computing in simple terms. Uh, or do you have any creative ideas for a 10-year-old's birthday party? And then it says a bit about its capabilities and also acknowledges some of its uh, limitations. It says it might occasionally generate incorrect information, and it does, um, and it might give you that information in a way that sounds very uh, compelling and confident. It says that it may occasionally um, produce harmful instructions or biased content. We may question the occasionally qualifier there. And it says that it has limited or perhaps no knowledge of world events after 2021, which this uh, iteration, that is as far um, up to date as it was trained. Okay, so this is just a silly example. Uh, explain the plot of a particular film, Citizen Kane, uh, to a six-year-old. So that's the input that I put in. Uh, the output from ChatGPT, you can see it there, but it gives a, a sort of um, short explanation for a six-year-old um, target audience. And another example, uh, you might say, you could have it write an essay on a particular topic, but with certain parameters. Uh, so here, write a hundred word essay explaining the Kantian ethical position that lying is morally impermissible. And that that's kind of a generic sort of input, but you can make the input more sophisticated. You could say, write this many word essay in this style and be sure to reference X, Y, and Z things. So the more detailed the prompt that goes in, the more sophisticated the output is going to be, or the more detailed. Yeah, and just as to add to that, if you were to, um, if you were a student and you were to put in the prompt for um, an assignment, as well as like maybe the rubric or the language from the syllabus about how these things are evaluated, it could create something for that very specific context. So it's um, it's kind of a garbage in, garbage out, depending on what you put in as your as your prompt. You're going to get something more specific or more unique back. Okay, and then just very quickly um, to note, again, as we said, um, it's now in the, the new iteration is now released as of this month, that's ChatGPT4, and it can do some new things and it can do the old things better. Uh, so one new thing that it can do is it can take sort of multimodal inputs. So you could put in an image and have it respond to the image. So um, you can give it a picture of something you're trying to fix that's broken and ask how you fix it, and it gives you a textual, you know, instructions of how to fix it. Or I might put in a picture of my refrigerator and say, I have these items, what in the world can I make out of these items? And it might give me a recipe based on what it can see uh, is in my fridge. So that's a new development. And then uh, in terms of some of the old things it could do, like um, produce responses based on textual inputs or respond to test questions, it can now do both of those things uh, in a more efficient and presumably more accurate way with fewer errors. So this is one quick example of that. Um, if you see, oh, I'm trying to use my thing, it's, I'm not the one driving it. Uh, if you can see on the right column, uh, the previous iteration, if you look, for example, at the bar exam, um, it was performing in the 10th percentile. If you look at GPT-4, which was released this month, it's now performing in the 90th percentile, uh, which is kind of chilling to me. Um, but you can see with other uh, tests as well, GPT-4 is really outperforming the previous uh, iterations. It's interesting to me that the, the last writing is the only thing that hasn't really improved, but it's average on all of those. And it's a writing generator. That's what it does. So I wouldn't expect to see it improve its writing. It is it is amalgamating and averaging all the writing that it's been trained on, plus all the writing that people who are using it are putting into it. And so it will always be around the average writer um, because it's, that's what it's doing. It's an, it's an average textual um, prediction model. Okay, I wanted to talk just very briefly. I could talk about this all day because this is kind of what I do, but I wanted to talk very briefly about one of the one of the um, ways that we're thinking about and looking at Chat GPT as a historical um, moment that we're experiencing now. So this is this is all obvious to everyone um, if you stop and think about it, but I wanted to put it in a visual format so you could have a moment to to bask with us in the technological history of humans. Um, this is a 15, 150,000 year period right here. And I went in this timeline, I went from um, prior to language all the way to um, the invention of movable type in print in 1305. And so this is a really huge period of time. So you can see over that time, each of these blocks represents what media, media historians think of as like eras of communication technology. 
Um, and if you view the world through these historical lenses of, of technological inventions, um, you can see across every other domain of our lives where um, what type of communication technology or process is dominant in that era impacts everything else from how we do business to our values and um, our priorities as a culture. And um, there's tons of books written on that. If you're interested, send me an email because I, I mean, it. Uh, the implications are limitless really when you think across domains. But um, so, for example, in early humans, you know, our, our values were communal, our, our um, communication patterns were one-to-one. Um, -one. And then as things change over time, so here at, in this time period is when people start um, using symbols to represent thoughts and ideas and words. And then that moves into writing doesn't come along until um, 5,000 years before the common era. So that's a huge timeline. This is um, not to scale. So this is everything else. So starting with movable type now, um, this is only 718 years. So we just looked at 150,000. This is 718 years since movable type was invented. The print era lasts all the way until around 1792. In the print era, communication was in front of your face. Um, this also includes, by the way, photography and print photography, being able to print images. But um, an idea from a person could be distributed now. So there's um, the idea that an idea that I might have, I could put it down on paper and then I could print it in this, distribute it in a mass setting. So my idea doesn't just, I don't just write a letter to Heather, but I can write one letter and copy it now and I can send it out. And so um, the democratization of knowledge, um, the priority that humans be educated in everything increases as access to print materials increase. And so over time and throughout cultures, um, we start to value um, independence. Um, we start to value uh, autonomy, things like that. Um, so you see things like um, all the major revolutionary wars and um, religious revolutions um, that have as that have as their focus bringing um, uh, power to the individual and having you know people having a say in their own destinies and their own governance and their own um, religious decisions. So over time, that starts to change. Then when we have the electronic period starting in the 1700s, and I call this whole thing the electronic period, but really um, the, the big mass media inventions of radio, tel radio and television don't come to until um, the uh, end of this period. So there's about 100 years where it's telegrams. So being able to communicate over distance now instead of just um, by printing, we can communicate across time. And now we can also communicate across space um, in a more efficient way. Um, during this time period, messages become really standardized across communities. And so, um, you know, we are all as a country able to watch or listen to the president's address on the radio or watch the nightly news later. Um, and so messages become very standardized and um, consumerism really increases during this time period because we're all being sort of sold the same things. The digital age I put beginning in 14 and 1946, because that's when there was the first computer, the first program of computer, but it wasn't until the late 60s we had the internet, and then it wasn't until the 90s when home computers and the um, email and the World Wide Web was in the, in the 80s, um, and then social media toward the turn of the century. So that's the very, very end of what we've been doing all this time. So from a media history perspective, the only reason I'm giving you this, this lecture is because we have every reason to believe that if chat GPT changes the way that we communicate, if it becomes a, a turning point in history, that's a technological revolution, that it will impact every aspect of our lives, including our value systems and our ethics and our um, expectations for what it means to be human and how we interact in the world. And that to me is exciting and terrifying. Um, the digital age has done a number on all of us, and we all um, are are of the age where we can remember a time when we, you know, did things differently because we didn't have access to the internet. Even the youngest among us probably didn't grow up with it um, in our homes, for example, or at our fingertips, for sure. And so, um, this is a this is a change of that scale and maybe larger. Um, and I, I know it sounds like a text generator, so it seems like that seems like maybe an overstatement. But um, to show you a little bit of what I mean, I wanted to take just a brief moment to actually pull it up. This is what it actually looks like. It's a website. So when you think, oh, artificial intelligence, text generation, whatever, it sounds like 
that's not um, not something that everyone's going to be doing, but this is, it's just a website and you just type words and it types things back. Um, and it can, it can interact with anything. So I asked it today, you know, about its own ethical boundaries and it gave me some real generic response, but in the response, it says like, um, it's going to depend on the context, you know, the ethics of using this is going to depend on the context. Um, and we're, we're the ethical actors, we're the humans that'll be using it. And so, it's a new technology. It does not already come pre-equipped with an ethical system that is um, what we might want it to be, or that is equitable and fair and just. It's it's not value neutral. It comes with the average values of the internet, which if you've ever been on that, that's not super hopeful for me. It also comes with the added values on, and um, ethical guidelines imposed by the programmers. Um, not just it's not just a large language model. It's also has what they call guardrails put in place to keep it from doing bad things. So if you ask it to tell you how to assassinate the president, or if you ask it to um, make an offensive joke, for example, um, depending on how you word that prompt and the kinds of things you're asking it to do, it may tell you, no, I shouldn't do that. Um, I shouldn't I shouldn't give that kind of information. So depending on how something is programmed and um, what what precautions are in place and what it's trained to not do, um, it may or may not help you, but those are all value-laden decisions. Whoever's making the decision about what the limits of a communication technology might be, it I mean, that's a form of censorship and it's, um, it's a kind we haven't seen before um, because it's, it's structuring the language that we then may be using across domains and politics and potentially, um, of course, in advertising and definitely in entertainment, um, but also potentially in religion and in other domains that directly impact the development of our ethical selves. Um, education, obviously, is um, the one we're, we're most interested in looking at. Um, Can you see me typing here? Play. It says it can't provide legal advice. Actually, um, it does though, and it's being utilized um, through extensions to provide um, legal advice to people as sort of a service that you can like log in and get information. Um, you can use it to, um, it says it can't provide information about individuals that violates their personal privacy. Just the other day, there was a glitch in which users were able to see the chat histories of other users. Only a select group of users were able to see that, but that absolutely violates privacy. Um, it says it can't do anything illegal or unethical, um, but ethical is something that we have to decide what we think that means. And, um, it actually does all kinds of things and has said really hateful things. Just do a little quick Google search of some of the really ter terrible things that it's done, depending on how the prompt was worded. Um, and it also does some really interesting things about discrimination um, because of how it's programmed. And um, I'm not going to show you an example because I don't know what it'll say and it scares me a little sometimes. But um, for example, if you ask it to make a joke about a man it'll make a joke about how men are really dumb. But if you ask it to make a joke about a woman, it might say, um, I, I don't make jokes about people based on their gender or sexuality. Like that would be wrong of me to do. And so it has these guidelines that are just still in the very infancy of being built so that they have these loopholes and strange applications that don't always make perfect sense. Um, so back to the presentation. Okay. So I kind of place that in history. I'm not going to keep talking about that, but I have several books you can look at if you're interested in thinking about that history and how this, this um, might impact us now. All right, uh, Richard, would you like to do this part? Uh, let's see, so opportunities and risks. Sorry, was it? Was this? No, I had I, I put this up. in so I can introduce. Sorry, I, was like, I could try, but. Yeah. <laughs> and then bring it hand off to Richard. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Me. Yeah, so uh, given just sticking with the theme of sort of um, uh, exciting and terrifying that um, Rosemary just brought up, uh, this interview happened yesterday um, with OpenAI's um, co-founder and CEO, Sam Altman. Maybe some of you are familiar with um, him, but I always think it's interesting to see how 
the people sort of on the inside are thinking about these things and whether or not they are acknowledging the kind of um, ethical significance and the social significance of them. So uh, in this interview, uh, a, a tech reporter, um, Kara Swisher, says, uh, in the past, you had wrote that it was probably the greatest threat to continued existing humanity and also one of the greatest technologies that could improve humanity. Those things uh, appear to be in tension. Sam Altman says on the sort of positive side, well, I think we're finally seeing little previews of this with chat GPT and especially the GPT-4. People can see this vision where, just to pick one example of thousands, everyone in the world can have an amazing AI tutor on their phone with them all the time for anything they want to learn. And he says, that's wonderful. It'll make the world better. Uh, the creative enhancement that people are able to get from the tools and so on. And he says, and this is only in the most limited, primitive, larval, very beginning sort of stages. And, and that's a theme throughout the interview if you end up listening to it or reading it. Um, and he says, but he says, of course, there's levels of risk. There's levels of threats. He says, today we can look at these systems and say, all right, sort of no imagination required here. We can see how this can contribute to computer, computer security exploits or disinformation, which um, the three of us are concerned about, or other things that can really destabilize society. Sorry. Lakers. Yeah. Uh, and so he continues, he says, the reason we're doing this work, as in OpenAI, the, the company that's introduced ChatGPT, he says, the reason that we're doing this work is because we want to try to figure out how to minimize those downsides while still letting society get to the big upsides. Uh, and he says, we think that that's possible, but it requires the continual deployment in the world, giving access to people uh, to these things, where you let people gradually get used to it, right? It's sort of jarring at first to have new technology on the scene. He says to let people get used to it, where you give institutions and regulators and policymakers time to react, time to think about it, where you let people feel it and see what it can do, find the exploits. And he says the creative energy of the world will come up with use cases that all of the sort of uh, team that they could put together would never imagine. He says, so we want to see all of the good and the bad. I worry about the latter one there uh, and figure out how to continually minimize the bad and improve the benefits. He says, you can't do that in the lab. You have to put this thing out in the world and, and, and let it go. So we wanted to pull out a couple ethical concerns, and I'll go through these pretty quickly. So hopefully um, after Richard introduces some of the rhetorical concerns, we can sort of um, have a conversation. But uh, when, when this kind of burst on the scene, us um, folks that are in some way connected to academia, the kind of immediate conversation and concerns were all about plagiarism, right? Students are going to use this to uh, complete their in-class essays, take their test, all of those things. Of course, that's a concern. Uh, so is concerns about sort of research integrity, right? Just as much as students might use it for coursework, researchers might be using it in a variety of ways. We talked about um, some of the ways it could be used for better and worse uh, in a different session yesterday. There's also concerns about technological dependence and sort of skill lost. Um, the sort of imperfect analogy people make is like, when everybody has a calculator, do we lose the capacity for mental math? When everybody has a GPS in their car, do we lose the capacity for navigation? And so there's a question about what skills in writing, communication, critical thinking, uh, our sort of dependence on these technologies might lead to. Uh, there's questions about the reliability of the outputs and uh, needing to sort of continually fact check them and, and um, having the critical thinking capacities to do that. There's uh, questions about equity and justice in the access. So right now there is the free model, but there's also a paid model that is more consistent, more reliable, uh, faster, not as subject to sort of crashing and all of those things when too many people are using it uh, and so on. We as academics uh, uh, are concerned about how this might contribute to inequities and in what counts as productivity, right? Something that all of us uh, are measured against to some extent or another. So if some in the academy are using this to produce grant proposals and conference panel proposals and abstracts and all of the things or to uh, write multiple iterations of their research papers, then right, that gives some people an advantage in productivity that we might think there are some uh, ethical concerns around. And then lastly, sort of transparency, right? If I'm using ChatGPT to generate some uh, content. Am I letting people uh, know that? Sorry, go ahead, Rosemary. I didn't know I was even clicking. Okay. Uh, th that's okay. <laughs> uh, so, and just a few more. So, uh, and again, we can talk about these in the end with, with the remaining time. 
But there are questions about who owns the output, right? Uh, is it me because presumably I crafted the prompt that, that generated some output uh, or, right, is it open AI? So there's questions there about sort of ownership. Yeah, uh, or also questions. is it like the world? Because it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just drawing on everything that exists um, that is streamed on. It's plagiarizing everyone. Um, if you've posted a thought that was a unique thought online, it's and we did that prior to 2021 and it was trained on that, then it's able to generate that as if it's its own unique thought. And then a researcher or a student could potentially use that without citing it because um, there's no citation for that. It comes from an amalgamation of data. Sorry to interrupt you. I just was worried about that for myself. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, you're fine. And then similarly, like what counts as intellectual work, or we might add what counts as creative work, um, right? If I, uh, if I'm a poet and I come up with a really cool concept for a poem, and I sort of input that concept and I get a poem, right? Is that am I doing creative work at that point? And of course, all of this connects to real questions about values, right? Do do we care about uh, whether the the creative and intellectual uh, products out in the world were created by human beings? Do we care about originality? Do we care about these things? Or do we simply care about efficiency and productivity and output and things like that? So there are real um, values questions that that we all need to sort of grapple with and address. Okay, Richard, now you're up to bat. All right, a little more comfortable with this. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so uh, a couple of concerns from uh, my perspective, focusing on rhetoric as I do. Um, and as Rosemary was saying, this is something I could talk about for hours. Uh, but I just chose two, two small things to kind of bring up and, and discuss for this session. One is the idea of rhetorical agency. So I had uh, two uh, quotes that I grabbed to kind of help frame the idea of rhetorical agency. Uh, one from Aaron Rand that you can see there, this idea that uh, it creates effects through formal and stylistic conventions. Uh, anytime that, you know, someone gives a speech or has a discussion where they're trying to convince somebody or get them to act or not act or so on and so forth, we're kind of in the realm of rhetoric, right? So the agency that's involved there is that ability to, to think about it, to respond to it, to consider uh, ideas of audience and purpose, right? These things that we sometimes in uh, first year composition that we're always trying to get our, our freshman students to consider uh, in all sorts of texts that they usually just kind of gloss right over, right? Um, and then I found this other one. It was on a website that was IGI Global, but I really liked the uh, the definition that it provided. Uh, Kenneth Burke is a pretty big name in rhetoric from uh, 50s, 60s time period. And uh, this idea of rhetorical agency as inherently human capacity to act and is intrinsically human ability to act upon evaluations and to question. And so we have this idea of agency through consideration of language use. And if, as Rosemary was kind of implying, the um, generative AI is something that kind of redefines how we are communicating with each other, how, how media, how um, conversations, how discourse happens, then what's going to happen with that agency? Do, do we still have that agency to make these decisions and think about it if we are being provided this information through this kind of amalgamation, right? It's something to, to kind of think about and consider in the back of your mind as we kind of go into that Q&A and we start, uh, we can look at and, and if you play with the, the model. By the way, Rosemary, I did the tell me a joke about a man, tell me a joke about a woman, still doing the same thing. It totally provided a really off color weird joke about Ben and said, nope, I can't tell you a joke about women. That's in inappropriate. So there's, there's some interesting you know, uh, ideas of agency there as well. And this goes into the next slide of the concept of uh, flat the flattening effects. This is something from at least that I have uh, experienced and learned it from uh, Jonathan Alexander and Jacqueline Rhodes. And I have the uh, the article name there after the quote. Um, the idea that this kind of appeal to we're all the same is used often to kind of introduce and bring in marginalized groups. Uh, Alexander and Rhodes specifically um, work with queer theory a great deal. Uh, so they were looking at it in terms of uh, 
composition classrooms and how texts that uh, interact with and work with queer ideas and embodied people are brought in in this kind of way that says, oh, well, we're all just the same, it's all okay. And the problem with that is it's called the flattening effect. So it, it washes past and dismisses the idea that even though, yes, we are all human, we have very different experiences of the world through our various uh, identities or experiences as being different, right? So if we are starting to get information from a program like this AI that is just getting an average of information and trying to give you the best, which is a whole completely <laughs> idealized laden co concept of you know what the best answer is, um, if we're getting this kind of averaging of all that, then it is absolutely flattening all these differences, all these different perspectives, all these different um, marginalized groups who have just recently in this, you know, the, the larger scheme of like the academy been able to say, hey, wait, let's look at this from a different perspective. And suddenly we're, we're going right back to this average. Let's just average it all and, and provide this information. So these are two kind of rhetorical concerns that have been floating in my mind as we've been working on and uh, looking through this idea of these generative AIs. Yeah, that last one is um, one of my main concerns. Um, even when it's, you know, those guardrails are intended to be put up to um, keep it from doing things that we might agree are offensive um, or wrong. It's still, um, if you're eliminating aspects of free speech in the process of creating ideas and deliberating, there's massive implications for what that might do, not to mention the fact that the value system that it's promoting is is a white ethnocent uh, or Western kind of um, centered view, and it's it's leaving out everything else that's not that's not part of that paradigm of what's being you know acceptable at the moment. So this last little section is the um, but wait, there's more section where you know we kind of pull a little bit of um, the same strategy that the founder mentioned in his interview, which is to say, um, yeah, it's, it's a dangerous tool. And we've discussed a couple of those concerns, but now we want to talk about a couple of things um, that we need to keep in mind because um, there are a couple of ways we can utilize it for equitable purposes and to help with um, some of the problems that we might see in our institutions or our industries. So first of all, you can't, you can't ban it. Um, you can try, but it's not like, TikTok, you're just going to like make it illegal or something. You know, people are going to be able to access this. This is one of many tools that can do this now that the technology is out. Um, you can't keep people from using it. It's also very difficult to detect. There are a lot of AI detect and detection websites sort of like turn it in where you can run text through it and it'll tell you the likelihood that it was created by AI. Um, but the AI gets better and less detectable and those are very unreliable um, unless you have some some real evidence, it's really hard to um, to prove that something is made artificially this way, especially because it it reflects a standard writing style that we use as academics very often. And so it actually looks very much like academic language in some ways. Um, it's very it would be very challenging. Can you imagine all of the output that your students produce that's words um, or everything you do that's words? like if i'm if I'm being evaluated, as um, a colleague based on my collegiality, for example, and my emails that I'm composing. And that's everything. I mean, everything I do is text-based except for when I'm talking to people. Um, but even that is built on the text that I can generate. So um, um, besides that, it um, could be helpful in some ways. And we've thought of several ways that you can use it to enhance equity. Um, and because it's not going anywhere, this technology now exists and all industries will adapt to it. If we aren't preparing our students to use it in a way that's responsible and, and um, in light of these ethical concerns, then we're doing them all a disservice and they will not be competitive in the job market, whether they're going to a field where writing is the main thing or not the main thing. Um, verb like word outputs and this is more than just creating content or creating poems this is um, making plans for marketing you can make a marketing plan you can make a content plan you can um, do a competitor analysis you can um, analyze um, weaknesses in your competitors strategies there's there's um, in terms of political communication and all of the things you can think of that you could do with information, um, create disinformation, create 
um, an analysis of weaknesses, de demographic needs analysis. Um, it can do a lot of things. So it's not just for people who are who are going into careers in writing. For all students, they need to be prepared to um, use this in a way that recognizes its blind spots and um, doesn't exploit its weaknesses. Um, a couple of things we've thought of. Um, ChatGPT is an excellent way to increase equity in um, education for a lot of students who may not have access to some of the same tools that others come in with. So I'm sure you've all noticed among your own students, such a wide variety of levels of preparation for college work. Um, and ChatGPT can be used for remediation and skills. Um, it, if you chat with it and use it as an actual chat bot, you can have conversation and you can use a Socratic method with it for it to help teach you um, to, you know, understand a concept. It can help critique your writing and help you improve it by pointing out specifically what areas are wrong and why, um, what what grammatical rules are, are being violated or otherwise, um, rather than just making your content better for you, it can be used as a tool to help you understand um, what needs to be made better in, in, in terms of your content. Um, it's an excellent um, potential equalizer for um, people for whom English is not their first language. And this was one of the first cases that I thought of, and I was actually asked about it just recently. Um, you know, if you are um, trained in a discipline and you're applying for a job and you have to put together a cover letter, um, this tool can help you do that. Um, the question, of course, is when it stops being your work and when it starts being something else. So really, it's it's a question of putting in a good prompt. So if you've already written materials, then you can ask um, ChatGPT to, to improve the, the grammar and the flow and the organization or things like that that might be challenging. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of students have um, a lot of privileges in their upbringing. They're able to access tutoring. They're able to access you know, foreign languages and um, you know, training in, in um, instruments and computers and all kinds of things. And this is free. A, a version of it is free. The paid version is not free, but still cheaper than a tutor. Um, and it's a, a, it has some potential there to really help with kind of leveling the playing field um, in a lot of ways that are really important in, in, in what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish in the university. This is just an example. So um, I, I teach a lot of um, writing, just like just like Richard. Um, so there's always those rules that people don't understand. And Richard's got the semicolons. My my example would be something like passive voice, trying to help students understand it. But um, you can ask it to explain it. But you can also then have a tutorial with it, where you it gives you a question and you try to answer it. It tells you if you're right or not and why. So it's really a question of um, what the prompt is, whether you're going to get something that's not just giving you the answer, or if you're going to get something that's um, helping you learn um, as a tool, which is is what we're hoping to figure out how to promote the use of it as a, a learning tool and not a doing tool, um, or not only a doing tool. This is just another example of, of editing, how it can correct the mistakes in a sentence. That's our that's our presentation. Um, we'd love to talk to you more about more specific things, or do some more examples, or or whatever it is that you'd like to discuss and and see more of. Thank you all so much for for listening.